prophet Jeremiah once said, this is what the Lord says, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. We're headed down those ancient paths, uncovering the historical and cultural context of scripture and discovering life-changing truth that you can use in your own life today. We're searching for all those secrets that are hidden in plain sight on the pages of your Bible. Thanks for joining us. I'm Andy Cook. I want to return to the conversation Jesus had with a woman at the well. You know the story? You can find it in John chapter 4. The short end of the story is that Jesus was alone at a well, thirsting for water in Samaria. It was probably very hot. Little wonder that Jesus was there hoping someone would come along who could help him. But the undertones of the story are very, very stressful. Jesus was a Jewish man. By traveling into the heart of Samaria, he's definitely in the wrong place and around the wrong people. If he's not welcome there, it would have come as no surprise to anyone in Israel. Now, a Samaritan woman comes out and she's got her guard up. Jesus is a stranger to her. Plus, he's a man. He's a Jewish man. Her community has a lot of racial and social anger aimed at men like Jesus, and she's got a good bit of personal baggage weighing her down. And it's hot. That never helps an uncomfortable situation. In the conversation, Jesus tells her if she wants it, he's got living water to offer her. She knows what living water is, even if that's not a phrase you would use every day. In Hebrew, people spoke of mayim haim, or water with life in it, mayim haim, living water, and it might describe something like a waterfall. Now, who wouldn't like to play in a waterfall on a hot day? It's an incredible sensation, and if you can find a waterfall in Israel in the summertime, you'll almost certainly find plenty of people around cooling off in the Mayim Chaim. This very waterfall is part of a place called En Gedi. There's another series of waterfalls not all that far from this hidden waterfall, and I'll show it to you in a moment. But you'll never appreciate the waterfalls of En Gedi until you see where En Gedi is and maybe spend a few days hiking around the heat of the desert. En Gedi is in the rocky desert of the Judean wilderness. And I'll say it again, until you've spent some time there, it's really impossible to describe how rugged, how difficult, and how hot the Judean wilderness can be. It's not the kind of place where you, you would want to get lost. What a nightmare! Your phone reception is zero, your water bottle is empty, and you can't really tell whether you're going north, south, east, or west because of the canyons. Panic can set in, for another thing would also be obvious. No one lives in the Judean wilderness. You can go for miles and miles and miles without seeing another human being in the wilderness. But En Gedi is different. About halfway down the Dead Sea shoreline, you'll find a crack in all those canyons that leads to an oasis. You can't see it from the road, so if you don't have a guidebook and you're not watching very closely, it's possible for your tour bus to race by the place without so much as a glance to the west. But it's there, and it's amazing. En Gedi is a place of unspeakable beauty and refreshment and home to the cleanest, most refreshing water in all of Israel. The water of En Gedi has traveled underground from the ridge of the Judean mountains near Bethlehem and Jerusalem, moving drop by drop underground through miles and miles of rocky soil until it reaches the lowest elevations on earth near the Dead Sea. By the time that water bursts forth from its natural underground storage locations at En Gedi, it is therefore the cleanest water in the world, and it's cold. It's life-giving. It's, it's a liquid massage if you can sit under one of those smaller waterfalls. No wonder David hid from Saul in En Gedi. The tallest waterfall is named the David Falls in his honor. There's one other aspect to En Gedi's location that makes the living water you find there even more special, and that would be the Dead Sea. How ironic it is that the Dead Sea is the largest body of water in Israel. The shoreline is far shorter today than it once was, but it is still an impressive body of water. The thing is, it's full of salt. Parts of the Dead Sea are one-third salt. It's eight times saltier than the average ocean. Yes, you can float in it if you like, or you can use the mineral-rich water as a skin treatment, but to drink it, 
That's just not going to work. You will die if you drink Dead Sea water. The more you drink, the more your thirst will increase. The Dead Sea cannot satisfy your thirst no matter how much you try to drink of it. I suppose if you're going to call the freshwater of En Gedi living water, then the Dead Sea must be providing death water. Listen again to what Jesus said to the woman at the well. If you had asked, you could have had living water. Where is she? She's at a well which has stagnant water. Yes, it would keep her alive, but she can't even think about washing her hair, her clothes, or soaking in a long bath. That's not going to happen. But Jesus is offering her something that she knows is really, really good, something pure, something refreshing, something life-giving. And this water, like, like a waterfall, is overwhelming. Not only can you stand under it as if it were a shower, but you can go to bed tonight knowing that it will still be out there tomorrow, still pouring away in a, with a thundering amount of living water. Living water will simply never run dry. The woman at the well had been through a difficult life. She had already been through five husbands. She was living with a man to whom she wasn't married even then. Was this because of her own lack of ability to hold down a marriage? Or was it because life had been especially cruel to her? Maybe she had actually seen the death of five husbands. Such tragedy happens. All we know is that Jesus assured her that he had this living water in him, and he was willing to give it to her. And she took it. The entire village took the offer Jesus gave them. It was a remarkable encounter. As people heard what Jesus had to say, it was as if they heard the cleanest, most refreshing message they had ever heard. They were immersed in the message of hope that he brought them. Maybe that's something you're interested in, too. Now, could I close this illustration, this episode, with an illustration of water? I've seen a lot of people try to drink what I would call the Dead Sea water of our own culture. And most of us have at least tasted of what our culture offers us. And many have found a lifelong struggle they'll have to deal with the rest of their lives. They've, they've tried sexual pleasure that's uncontrolled or, or alcohol that gets out of hand, drugs, you know, money, the, the, the unrelenting pursuit of money, popularity, power. They've tried so many things looking for satisfaction only to discover that none of those things can ever offer genuine satisfaction. In fact, trying to find satisfaction in the things our culture offers us is a lot like drinking salt water. The more you drink of it, the thirstier you get, and the more damage you do to your own body. And ironically, the more you drink of it, the more you want to drink of the very thing that's killing you. That's what so many things in our own culture will do for you, will do to you. But Jesus is out there offering amazing, life-giving water. And, and if you can find him, if you can find the living water, you'll finally find what you've been looking for. And again, I'd like to use the illustration of the land of the Bible to drive home the point. Now, pretend you're a first-time visitor to the land of the Bible. You know that somewhere out there in the Judean wilderness is En Gedi. You've heard about it. You'd like to see it for yourself. You'd like to stand under one of those waterfalls. All you need to know is where to go. And if you know which one of these dozens of canyons to enter, and if you're willing to take a one- or two-mile hike into the correct canyon, you'll find a little paradise of fresh water, wonderful waterfalls, plenty of animals, vegetation, and happy people. All you've got to do is know which canyon leads to life. The problem? There are a lot of other canyons, and all of the other canyons will lead to death. The Dead Sea, right behind you, will lead to death. Only that one canyon, that one crack in the wilderness will lead to life. You cannot afford to make a mistake with the choice of where you are going to go, of, of the way you will choose. And if your culture tells you something like, hey, don't worry about it, all roads lead to heaven. The life-threatening choice you must make in the Judean wilderness will tell you something completely different. Only one path in the wilderness will take you to En Gedi and to life. That's the lesson from the land of the Bible. Jesus once said this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's in John chapter 14, verse 6. You know, that message has become increasingly unpopular in recent years in our culture, but it will never change. 
Jesus said he was and is the only way to life. He's the only truth. He's the only way. He's the only path that will take you to living water. You know, it doesn't matter what your culture might say. It might, maybe you hear a message from your culture, for instance, that says, don't worry about religion. All roads lead to heaven. (laughs) That can't be true. I mean, listen to the land of the Bible. Look at the land of the Bible, the Judean wilderness. All those canyons out there, they don't all lead to life. Only one of them does. Only one crack in the canyon, only one path will take you to En Gedi. All of the others will lead to a really bad experience, and if you're not careful, you could lose your life there. Now, that's the lesson from the land of the Bible. And and that's the message from Jesus. I am the way. I am the path, the only way. And so no matter what kind of criticism you hear because of the choice you make, if you you really want to find the life that is ultimately satisfying, you're going to have to find Jesus and only find Jesus. Well, listen, thanks for joining us for this week's edition of Secrets from the Ancient Paths. If you'd like to see more of these short lessons, um, you can go to secretsfromtheancientpast.com or search for Secrets from the Ancient Paths on any podcasting platform. I hope you will, will do that. You'll enjoy these messages and help us spread the word about this resource. Share this message with your friends. As always, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time as we continue to uncover all those truths that are hidden in plain sight on the pages of our Bibles. Until next time, I'm Andy Cook.